I'm Alex, and I'm an operations engineer for years. And my session is about configuration management tools, and I promise you, this is not going to be fun. And if you leave, um, uh, it's, it's, it's okay. <laughs> I understand. Uh, so, um, I'm an operations engineer at some company and a researcher uh, at, at my university. Let's start from the very beginning. Are you aware of DevOps buzzword? Do you know what is DevOps? Uh, are you a Raise your hand if you, are, if you are a configuration manager somewhere, or a release manager, or even a system administrator. OK. And if you need to ship a release, so you're probably a DevOps engineer, and uh, you can do it right now. It's OK. And if your process is solid enough, uh, you can ship while I'll talk. And uh, if you are using uh, modern configuration management tools, a, re a release can ship itself without even bothering you. And if you are anxious about your releases, you can just check if something is shipping or not now. OK. The problem is that everything can and should be automated. And humans don't need to apply anymore. And uh, even uh, if you, uh, OK, are there any Jenkins engineers here? So I can feel the pain. OK, how many jobs are going to run in parallel? <laughs> what does a configuration management process look like? We define a desired state, and we would like to define it declaratively. And we instruct a configuration management master tool uh, to get a system to that state. And we would like to get a system to that state idempotently. What does that mean? Basically, idempotency is uh, Something that if you run your configuration twice, and if it's already applied, it won't be applied uh, if it's in place. So you won't break anything. You won't even modify anything if it shouldn't be modified. It's called other policy. And when you start applying your configuration, some configuration management magic begins. Do you believe in magic, by the way? I don't. And when midnight suddenly comes, and when your infrastructure magically gets to the desired state, in ideal world. Sounds not too difficult, and should be quite easy to implement. And that was promised to us years ago. A bit of history. Uh, have you ever used uh, the Puppet configuration management system? Any Puppet users? Raise your hands. Do you like it? For what reason? How is it possible? What's wrong with you? OK. I, 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 <laughs> I got it. I, I, I know a joke about solution architects, maybe about an owl and mice. I guess you probably are aware of it. OK. Have you ever used a chef configuration management system? Anyone? Do you like chef? OK. I understand you. I feel your pain. By the way, don't cry. It's a, it's a safe place. I'm a friend. Any Ansible users here? Well, actually, Ansible became a de facto standard in the modern world. And I'm an Ansible user, and I like it to some extent. It's not ideal. And if you know Ansible, let's, let's set up something using it. Let's configure something. I need a cluster. Well, actually, I don't need a cluster. I need a cluster monitoring tool. And I have a playbook for it. I wrote it years ago, five years ago or so. And I have a repo for it. It's, um, it's on GitHub. And let's observe it for a moment. What's inside? There are a number of tasks inside. And we are applied, from, we are applied top down. And uh, there is a task which puts a service descriptor somewhere and restarts a supervising tool. Because I need a working service. OK, what's wrong with it? Nothing. It's beautiful. Then the problem is that it doesn't work anymore. It's poorly written. It's not documented. Nobody uses it. It's not supported. I abandoned it years ago. And it still has seven stars on GitHub. It's, it's one of my most popular projects. I don't know why. I, I, I don't understand how, it's can, how it can be used. 
Um, so I rewrote it. I created a role, implemented basically the same, but in in our cons uh, constructions in our words. And what's inside? This time I used systemd, and I used Ansible role for systemd, and I uh, put a service descriptor. I enabled the service. Okay. We need some kind of declarative configuration management. And let's observe it. A set of tasks running from very beginning to end. And uh, they are position matters, so they can be mixed. Is it really declarative? It isn't. If it's declarative, what's imperative then? What's wrong with it? There is a subtle problem. I can't, we, we can't say for sure if the systemd service is running, if, is, is it running or not. And if you can, from this playbook, from this role, imagine a situation when you provide a service unit file and then use a notification mechanism to call an Ansible handler, which enables the service. It's, it's not easy to get if um, you don't have a role with it. It's hard to explain, but uh, for some reason, it's easy to implement, and uh, people tend to implement this kind of solutions, and uh, they're, they're proud of it. I, I, I'm not sure why. I don't know why, because uh, why Ansible even allows it? Because if your label run fails, there are no handlers. There is no handlers run at the end. And if you run this for a second time, your config is in place. It's uh, not overwritten, and handlers are not run. Your service is not even started. So it's kind of a Schrodinger's thing. You, you can't say for sure, because your configuration is not applied in full. OK. Let's review our goal for a moment again. We want to run a set of microservices, because in the modern world, everything is a set of microservices on top of a monolithic Linux kernel. It doesn't make a lot of sense for me, because uh, I believe that first thing is to break a monolithic kernel to a set of microservices. But it's not easy, so let's start with a user space. And we can consider services as building blocks. And I have a short dictionary for, for old people from late 19s, for people like me. A microservice is basically a process. Have you ever used Docker? I believe yes. Everybody should uh, have some notion of Docker, because it's it was a next big thing five years ago or so. And now it's, it's a big thing, yeah. The Docker image is basically a package. And Kubernetes is an operating system for, for microservices, an operating system for Docker packages. It's an orchestration tool. Basically, it collects resources from host nodes and presents these resources as, from, as a single pool of resources. And Helm is a package managing system for Kubernetes, like apt in Debian or yum in Red Hat Enterprise Linux. OK, let's try again. I have a number of, of, of lab repositories, a number of Vagrant labs in my, on my GitHub account. And you can just clone this repo, get a working copy, get Vagrant, and start the lab. What's inside? Basically, inside is a Vagrant-based Ansible provision Kubernetes setup. It doesn't, doesn't sound simple, but it's simple. Because Vagrant is just a, a tool for manipulating plain old virtualization. It's, it's just a um, configuration language, declarative configuration language on top of VirtualBox or other uh, providers of classic virtualization. And uh, I describe three Vagrant boxes in my Vagrant file. And I'm using Ansible to provision with Vagrant boxes, with three boxes. And I'm using kubespray to set up Kubernetes. And kubespray is just a set of Ansible roles and a set of Ansible playbooks to set up a Kubernetes cluster. As simple as that, you just describe your Kubernetes nodes in inventory, and you start Kubernetes, and some magic begins to apply. And if you are lucky, you will get a run on Kubernetes cluster. I, I was not so lucky, because Ansible guys broke uh, compatibility about 10 days ago or so with, with a new release of Ansible. And I had to revert back my Ansible installation. 
but uh, that's okay because it's a Python world, it's an Ansible world. And then my lab is using Helm to provision Kubernetes apps. Okay, what's inside an Ansible playbook? A set of roles which just uh, call Kubernetes, uh, we just call Helm and as roles uh, set up Kubernetes config files using Helm and uh, start Kubernetes applications. So how Ansible calls Helm? Ansible just uh, uses a template to provide Helm with custom configuration values. And there is a single command which does everything else. Just Helm upgrade, minus minus install. And as simple as that. And now a dictionary. Every new tool introduces a brand new language. And I'm quite tired of it, but it's life. It's inevitable. We can't stop it. So Ansible is called Helm in, in the Kubernetes world. And Ansible role is called a Helm chart. And Python is called Golang. And uh, modern Python is called Golang far outside the scope of this session. I believe that Golang is just a Python in disguise. And Jira templates are called, um, they are not called, just something, some kind of templating engine. It's unnamed. And there's a thing which didn't exist in, in the Ansible world. It's called Tiller. Okay, how Helm works? What's Tiller? Helm just generates uh, Kubernetes YAML configs using its custom template, templating engine. Helm transfers generated configs files to, to Kubernetes cluster. And then it instructs Tiller to start deploying them. Tiller is an agent which actively runs in the cluster. It's a cluster site, uh, part of a Helm, uh, Helm ecosystem. And then Tiller applies configuration files and then it labels a release. And you can say, perform an update on this release, you can delete this release, you can purge this release, and so on. You can basically manage this release using your client side Helm command line utility and Tiller on, on, on the cluster side. And it uh, reminds me, uh, a chef client which um, acted basically the same way seven years ago, but Tiller doesn't have a nice memory leak feature, which killed my hosts when I started with chef client and I just uh, had to revert to Chrome. I just stopped the client and said, okay, well, I will just uh, perform one short rounds of this client from, from Chrome. There is a Helm charts repository. And it's centralized, it's uh, open source, it's managed by community, it grows very fast. And if you submit a patch, I tried, it will be landed in about a month, which is quite fast, I'd say. Where is a Nice landing page for visual learners. And it contains uh, links to uh, charted apps. There are more than 200 charted apps. Uh, and the number is growing every day. OK, what's inside the chart? There is some net information file called chart YAML. There is some documentation and uh, as default set of configuration values. And there is a folder with templates, as simple as that. So templates are just Kubernetes configuration files, which are YAML files, and they are declarative configs. So there are, okay. I'm starting to blame Helm, that's fine. The problem is that everything is nice until you try to write something in template. Because this language is alien for anybody who is not a Lisper. And I'm not sure why did we do it. Because my colleague, he was a Lisper. He is a closure programmer and uh, he knows racket and scheme. And he tried to grasp this. He tried to create a, his own Helm chart. For some reason, he just put ginger strings to the Helm template system and he expected it to work. But that is not, not, not possible. But doesn't work this way. As you can see, we use a prefix notation. That's, that's okay for me. I'm a Lisper. Okay, so uh, what's, what I personally don't like with Kubernetes and Helm? 
I don't like Golang. Are there any Golang programmers here? Or any Python programmers? If you don't use Golang, just continue to not using it. Because I'm not sure why. Why on earth we are using Golang? We are human beings. We should just use something decent like uh, Camel, Haskell, whatever. But not with uh, what language for C people from previous age. Why Golang? Okay, so my conclusions are very simple. Classical configuration management systems uh, were broken, and uh, Kubernetes and Helm are broken too, but they are just less broken than anything uh, previously used for configuration management. But uh, right now I'm happy with Kubernetes and Helm because there is no magic, there are no unicorns. So let's uh, just use Kubernetes and Helm and see what will appear next. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Please, questions. No questions. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, we have like. Uh